How many of you are familiar with who this fellow is? Chris, you are. Oh, he, he uh, boy, I can't tell you how evil he used to be. And his mother was concerned about him. Now, how many of you have heard, uh, seen the movie, The War Room, W-A-R, The War Room? Well, this comes from Chris Yuan's mother. Did you all know that? They, they made the movie on her war room. She designated a room in her house as her prayer room to pray for her very evil son. And she talked to him about Jesus, and he got so exasperated. He said, Mother, soul, help me. If you ever mention God to me, you will never see me again. And so that's when she made a room into her war room. Boy, she'd go in there and earnestly, earnestly plead with God to save her son. And the more she prayed, the more evil he got. In fact, he ended up in a Georgia a federal penitentiary on drug charges. And, and he was wonderfully converted to Christ. He was standing by a garbage can one day. And something caught his eye in the garbage can. He reached down to pick it up, and it was a Bible that some inmate had thrown in there. He started reading. He said, I didn't start reading that Bible because I want to know about God. I want to be saved. I, used, I started reading that, God, that Bible to take up the time on my hands in prison. I, had to, I needed something to do. And he was wonderfully saved. He became a professor at Moody Bible Institute. Can you believe that? And when he was in prison, he applied to Moody. And who's he going to get as a reference? We got, he got an inmate as his reference. <laughs> and this fellow right here, I'm not going to give his last name because I don't have his permission to tell you. What? He got the chaplain to write him in. What's that? Chris Ewan had the chaplain on. Well, yeah, he did get the, uh, the chaplain to write him um, a, reference. a reference too, yeah. Um, but anyway, this fellow right here, uh, <laughs> I was having lunch with this guy. He was a student at Moody. He was older, older fellow. And I said, uh, what were you doing before you came to Moody? You didn't want to answer my question. He said, I was in jail. Oh, no, I was in prison. I said, why are you in prison? He said, well, I was a member of a Los Angeles gang. I got into a bunch of shootouts with other gang members. I got caught, and so I got, I got put in prison, and I eventually got saved. Now, when he came to Moody, he had a lot of rough edges. He got into an argument with his roommate one day, and bam, hit him right in the face and knocked him off his feet. And I said, man, you can't do that here. You're not still in prison. If that, if that student you had hit, press charges against you, you'd be back in jail right now. The guy... God cleaned the guy's life up. Where did he end up? Cambridge University. Can you believe that? Going from, going from Los Angeles uh, gang to jail to Cambridge University. Um, now the point is, God often saves the most sinful people we least expected to be saved. The miracle of the fish in chapter 2 was great. Swallowed. Stayed alive. Spit out. But the miracle of Nineveh's conversion in chapter 3 is far greater. It's so great that this Old Testament scholar, S.R. Driver, said it is impossible that a huge city with its king should be converted. He didn't believe a word of that. A later commentator said Professor Driver is right. In fact, any per conversion without God is impossible. Now, what we want to do is factor into the equation God. Now, that's what makes conversion possible. We need to factor God into the conversion. Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God resulting in salvation to everyone who believes. Now, by the verbal parallels in verses two and, uh, 1, 2, and 3, 2, it's clear that Jonah is given a second chance. Arise, go to the Nineveh, that great city, and cry. And what does the next verse say? He, he, he arose and fled from God. And then God repeats himself in 3, 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry. Why the repetition? He's given, offering Jonah a second chance. And he makes the most of his second chance. He does what God wanted him to do all along. He finally goes to Nineveh and preaches, but all is not rosy. This insubordinate prophet has been subdued. He's not been persuaded. He's changed a bit for the better, but his discipleship is incomplete. There are modern equivalents of this, of course. I'm thinking now of Tommy and Linda, not their real name, married couple in Chicago. She was on the verge of leaving him. He realized that unless he stopped his abuse, he'd lose her. So he straightened up just enough to keep her from leaving. And she told me, uh, things are better, but they're not great. They're not what I want. In other words, that husband stopped his abuse of his wife, but he didn't really have a change of heart. 
he just changed enough to keep her from leaving. Jonah's changed enough to get out of the fish's belly, but he's not yet where he should be spiritually. And sadly, we will see that shortly next week in chapter 4. Now, in this book, the scene has changed several times from northern kingdom south to the seaport of Joppa on board a ship, going down in the Mediterranean Sea, being next in the belly of a sea monster, and now he's in the city of Sodom. And in chapter 3, the word Nineveh occurs three, um, seven times. Let's see, Basima, uh, Nineveh is your birthplace, wasn't it? That's amazing, isn't it? We got somebody here who, who, was, who was born in Nineveh. Uh, here is the only chapter in the entire Bible where a Jewish prophet walks the street of a sinful pagan city. Now we have a parallel in the New Testament. Here is a Christian apostle who walks the street of, of uh, what? No, I'm thinking of um, in Greece, Athens. And he was vexed seeing all the idols. Mm -hmm. Sue and I were walking the streets of Amsterdam one night, and Sue said, now I, I appreciate uh, why Paul's spirit was vexed as he saw all those idols. And why, why was Sue vexed? Oh, the sin in Amsterdam is in your face, out in your face. Um, now, in the Old Testament, for the most part, people had to go to Israel to get the truth of, of God. In the New Testament, Jesus is going to reverse that and send his disciples from Israel to the rest of the world. Go into the world, he says. Never has there been such spectacular success of revival. Never has there been less likelihood of such success. A foreign evangelist from another country and culture in alien dress walking the streets of the world's most important city preaching about a strange God and wanting the world's greatest superpower, their country will perish without repentance. Who would suspect this pessimistic message would be successful? Here, heaven's veil is drawn back and we get to peer into the secret counsel of God. Look at this. Here's a slice of God's counsel. Jesus said to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is the biggest city in Galilee. That's where he made his headquarters for his ministry for three years. You are not going to heaven. You are going to hell. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it, Sodom, would have remained to this day. Now, you think, hear what he's saying? God made the decision that the miracles I did in Capernaum in your city limits, which did you no good, not a bit of good, but had I performed those miracles in Sodom, they would have repented. Sodom would still be on the ground today. They wouldn't be destroyed. Somebody made that decision. Why? We don't know. God's ways are beyond our understanding. I want to sum up Jonah 3 in one sentence. At the preaching of Jonah, Nineveh repents of its evil, evil and God relents of his punishment. And it breaks down into these paragraphs. Verses 1 and 2, repetition of the command to go to Nineveh. 3 through 4, revival. 5 through 9, repentance. And God relents and decides he's not going to destroy that nation. Okay, so let's, let's take your handout. This is my translation of the Hebrew text and work our way quickly through our passage for today. Now, uh, I suspect that between chapters 2 and 3, there was a gap of time. And that's why verse 1 begins with the adverb, subsequently. That is, after Jonah's disobedience, after the storm, after being spit out by the, the fish onto the beach. And so he's had time to process the experience learned. Now, one commentator makes this statement. I wish I'd put it in quotation marks. He's, he's right about this. Alienation from life as it is actually lived is always a major risk to, in biblical exposition. Now, what do you mean by that? It's almost a waste of time to study the Bible divorced from daily life. 
I, I remember a professor of mine in seminary said this to me. In order to really understand the Bible, you must be ministering to people. Now, I wonder if this isn't where uh, one, one place where Jonah made a mistake. Oh, he studied and studied and studied the Bible of a storm, but he seems to have divorced it from real people and the realities of life. That's why when God told him, go to Nineveh, forget it. Are you kidding? No, I'm going to stay here and study my Bible. Subsequently, verse 1 goes on to say, The word of the Lord came a second time to Jonah, saying... So the story's going to start over. Jonah is now back to square one. But Jonah is somewhat a different man. He is being offered a second chance by God. Well, others have had a second chance. Abraham did. He went down to Egypt and got into a world of trouble. And God ran him back up to uh, Canaan. Moses, he tried to rescue the Hebrews from slavery by killing an Egyptian guard, and Pharaoh was going to kill him. He had to run for his life to Midian. And back down in Midian, 40 years later, God gave him another chance. He made the most of it. Peter, he denied Jesus three times. Me, God told me to go to Moody Bible Institute in 1981. And where did I go? Do you remember where I went? Liberty University in Virginia. Uh, so what I knew God wanted us in Chicago, but we went to Liberty to please her parents. And uh, I wonder if there's somebody else I could add to the list right here about being given a second chance. I bet you there's not a person here in this room <laughs> who hasn't been given at least a second chance, maybe a third and fourth chance. We need to be careful. God's going to run out of, uh, of all his grace. And after we reject uh, chance number nine, he may say, that's it, I'm done with you. We don't want to get to there. So Jonah is a changed man, but his discipleship is incomplete. Now verse 1 says the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Verse 2 tells what that word was. Arise, go to Nineveh. Uh, now that's going to take effort and time to do it. And he doesn't want to go, as we're going to see. Now, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, um, I had prostate cancer, and the surgery just sapped my strength. And that was on the verge of the school year being ended. Now, even when I'm in good health, at the end of a year teaching at Moody, I am exhausted. It's like I've run a marathon. But with the addition of that surgery sapping my strength, I was doubly tired. And then the school was really insensitive to me. As soon as uh, the school year was ended, summer school started. And Moody said, we, we, we want you to teach a class for us in summer school. And I said, no, I don't want to. I'm tired. And they said, no, 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 we need you. If we can't get you, that class isn't going to have a teacher. So I did it. And so the class is over with uh, so, so many weeks. And then on June the 4th, that's our wedding anniversary, I took Sue out to a, a certain Chinese restaurant that we always visit for celebrate our wedding. And um, I said, Sue, tomorrow morning, I've got to catch a plane and go to Peru for a week to teach missionaries. The last thing I feel like doing tomorrow is getting on that plane. I'm so tired and worn out is going to Peru. And then I said, but you know what? Those missionaries are constantly giving and giving to them of themselves to minister to people. They deserve somebody to come down there and teach them the Bible. That's why they asked me to come down there and teach them. So I didn't want to go, but I did want to go now for the missionaries. And I did. And even though I was so tired, that week down in Peru turned out to be the best week in the whole summer. So now Jonah is told, arise. Well, he doesn't want to go either. Go to Nineveh, that great city, great how? Politically, militarily, great in sin, great in need. And proclaim the message which I am about to repeat to you. Don't decide, Jonah, you're not to decide what the message is. You're not to change the message. You're not to criticize it, critique it. Just preach the message that I'm going to give you. So now, uh, three things are crystal clear. Where to go? Nineveh. What to do? Preach. And the origin of the message doesn't come from you. It comes from God. Did Jonah obey this time? Verse 3 tells us. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. Now that's in contrast with 1-3. He arose there too in 1-3 to flee in the opposite direction. He went to Liberty University like I did. He was going to Spain. He got swallowed by a whale. Soon I got swallowed by a whale in Lynchburg, Virginia, we got, the whale that we got swallowed by was what? you remember what it was? 
marriage problems. <laughs> Boy, were we, were we humbled. So he, he arises and go. And his going is a fruit of divine discipline. No discipline for the moment seems to be joyful, but sorrowful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness, not for everybody, but only for those who have been trained, only by those who cooperate with it and go along with God. Uh, and that, as this man did, Lord, it was good for me that I was afflicted by you. Why? So. I would obey your word. So the Lord knows what he's doing. Now, verse 4 is surprising. So much effort to get Jonah to Nineveh. Now that he's there, look at verse 4. We have one verse to tell us what his ministry was. Can you believe that? This whole book is created to get him to go. All right, he's there. Now, it, we're, we're probably going to have about 15 chapters of Jonah telling us, what his ministry is like? No, we have one verse. That's it. I'm in mean, verse 4. When Jonah began to go through the city, uh, no, let me go back to uh, the last line of verse 3. It took three days to walk through this city. It was huge. Think about it. Three days to walk through it. I wonder if we couldn't walk through Chicago in a day or two. I don't know that it would take us three days to walk through uh, Chicago. Maybe it would. But anyway, Nineveh must have been huge. Now, verse 4 is surprising. When Jonah began to go through the city just one day's distance, he cried out and said, now here's this message. In 40 more days, did you know that the number 40 in the Bible is the number of testing? Uh, Noah's flood, it rained uh, 40 days and 40 nights. Israel was tested and tried by God in the desert 40 years. The Jewish spies were in Canaan for 40 days, spying it out and seeing what the land was like. Goliath taunted Saul's army for 40 days, testing them to see if there was one man with the slightest bit of courage to come out and face him. Jesus fasted and was tempted and tried by the devil 40 days. Jesus' post-resurrection appearance was 40 days. And then after Jesus was crucified, 40 years, God gave the Israelites a chance to repent, and they didn't, so he had the Roman army destroy Jerusalem. So let's go back to verse 4. What's his message? In 40 more days, Nineveh shall be destroyed. Um, Isaiah 55, 6. Uh, we need to remember this. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. What's the significance of that? God has patience. There's a limit to his patience. He's not always going to give a person an opportunity. Um, at some point, his patience runs out, and that is it. God walks away from certain people never to return again. Why? He sees. They're never going to change. I'm wasting my time and effort, and in the process... His heart is getting harder and harder. I'm giving him more and more of my grace and opportunity to repent. It's going to bring greater punishment upon him. I'll do him a favor by walking away, offering him no more chances, so his judgment, his final judgment, won't be as, as severe. Now, this uh, message, actually, we look at, we look at uh, verse 4. His message consisted of uh, one word in Hebrew. Neth paketh. Now that word means two things. Either it, that is Nineveh, will be destroyed, or it, Nineveh, will turn around, that is repent. Actually, I think it means both here. And I think what Jonah was saying is, if you don't turn around and, re and uh, repent of your evil, you will be destroyed. Uh, now, on one hand, that's not a happy message. Uh, and people don't want to hear that. Now, there's a, there's a golden cord, a silver cord in that lining, and that is repentance, forgiveness. But it's dependent upon you repenting and turning away from your evil. Um, I, I, there have been times I've witnessed to people, and I just thought I was about to get beat up when I, when I reminded them that they were sinners and they were going to hell. Oh, boy, they get in my face. And I was just... I was. I was ready to get beat up. I thought that was going to happen. Some of my students at Moody go out on the streets. They're hitting the heads with lead pipes. They're punched in the face because they're witnessing the people. 
And some people just resent the Christian gospel. And so this was, this was not the happiest message. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so shall the Son of Man be to this generation. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, the last part of the verse, I think, means, Jesus, remember, they, they were constantly saying, give us a sign, a sign, it's a miracle. Give us a miracle so we know you're from God. We know you're the Messiah. Jesus said, okay, here it is. I'm going to be raised from the dead. Now, the fact that I'm, you're going to crucify me and I'm going to come back to life again, what does that tell you? God sent me here. I'm not here by myself. Now, what does it mean when it says Jonah became a sign? Well, now, he's walking through Nineveh, and he's preaching. Now, he, remember now, he, he's, a, he's a foreigner, um, and he's telling people that God has sent me here to warn you, if you people don't turn from your sins, he's going to destroy you in 40 days. Now, uh, why would they believe that message? That's a message that's repulsive to them. Who in the world do you think you are? Some fellow from Israel coming over here and telling us that we're going to perish while we ought to just stomp you in the mud right now. He thought he was going to get beat up. What would make them think there might be some truth to this? Do you remember that man that I mentioned last week who in 1891, um, a sailor who was swallowed by a whale and he stayed, I think, in the stomach like 24 hours or maybe 48 hours and he was cut out by his fellow sailors and he was delirious for two or three weeks and his uh, the newspaper report mentioned that he was bleached by the gastric juices in the, in the belly of the whale and, the, and the, the newspaper reported him as having deathly whitened skin. Uh, well, what do you think Jonah looked like now as he walks through? <laughs> <laughs> and his clothes too, yeah. <laughs> and and so he tells them, yeah. I, I think some of those sailors probably were men about when they came back home. Well, that's right. Some of those, some, that's a good point. It, it, it maybe one or two of those guys were home on leave, and they were saying, hey, uh, aren't you Jonah? Weren't you on our ship? I thought you were dead. I thought you drowned. No, I got swallowed and spit on the beach. And so they can verify, you know, this guy, we were with him on deck. He was the cause of all our trouble. We were all about to drown like rats in the sea. And we had to throw him overboard. As soon as we did, perfect calm. I didn't know you were swallowed by a whale. I'm surprised to see you. And so uh, there had to be some, something but, uh, I think the Holy Spirit used to convince these people in Nineveh, this guy may be credible. He may be speaking the truth. But the Spirit of God used that to convict them of their sin. Now, uh, what were the results of his message? Verse 5, Then the Ninevites believed, now notice what the next word is, not. Not Jonah, although they did believe Jonah. They believed God. Why did they do that? We, con we also constantly thank God that when you receive from us the word of God's message, you accepted it not as the word of men. Well, in one sense, it is. It's immediately from man. But for what it really is, ultimately, it's the word of God which also does its work in you who believe. So when they heard Jonah preach, they were convinced this is not the word of some human being. It's the word of God. Uh, now remember what Driver said, it's impossible that a huge city with its king should be converted. It is impossible. But when you factor God in it, all things are possible. Again, why? It is the, the, the gospel is the power of God. Doesn't God have the power to convince a sinner of his sin and persuade him that he needs to turn away from it or he's going to be damned and help him turn away from it? Doesn't God have the power to impart into that repentant sinner new life that shows itself in fruits of righteousness? God can do that. So verse 5, then the Ninevites believed God. Consequently, they called for a fast and put on sackcloth. Uh, this, is, this is repentance. Now what's repentance? Repentance is a, now it's not man who does it. Divine, man repents but what's behind it. Re, repentance is a divinely wrought change of mind about and a renunciation of one's previous sinful beliefs, wrong attitudes, and improper conduct. I'm done with it. The best of my ability. 
And who is it that repented? Look at the last line. From the greatest to the least of them. That's a figure of speech. Merism. The use of two opposites, the greatest, the most important of the people in Nineveh, to the least. The, bigger, the beggars. The homeless people. The use of two opposites to denote totality. Everybody repented. Now verse 6 illustrates that statement of the preceding verse. From the greatest to the least. Because it's going to talk about the greatest person in Nineveh. When this word reached the king of Nineveh. Now what word? The word word means report. When this report reached the king of Nineveh. What report? Jonah's preaching. The news of people's response of returning, or returning from their sins. He arose from his throne and stripped off his royal robe and put on sackcloth and sat down on ashes. In other words, he's showing signs of repentance. I think... The king of Nineveh felt worse than anybody in Nineveh. Why would he feel so bad? I have done a very bad job of using my authority to lead this nation. I have done such a bad job of taking them down the wrong path that the wrath of God is about to fall upon my country because of my bad leadership. I think he felt worse than anybody. Wouldn't it be wonderful, folks, if our leaders today who are so incompetent and bad and misleading us would be struck with, by God with repentance for their bad job of what they're doing to our country? That would be wonderful. I think that's what we need to be praying for. Now, but the people's repentance in verse 7 becomes government policy. And he, the king, issued a proclamation publishing it in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his officials. Neither human nor animal, neither herd nor flock must taste anything. They must not graze. They must not drink water. The, ro the royal decree continues in verse 8. And they, man and animal, must clothe themselves with sackcloths. Now, think about it. Uh, the inclusion of animals shows how serious the king is. He's so afraid that God's going to destroy his his country off the map of the, of the earth, he wants animals to repent. Well, do animals sin? No, they don't. Even if a tiger eats you, he's only doing what nature has wired him up to do. He's eating you. Well, God you can't. What? God commanded them not to. Say that again. God commanded the animal not to eat the man in Genesis. Did they? Did he? Yeah. Yeah, okay, find that for me, would you? Maybe animals do sin. <laughs> I'm not sure when, an, when God commanded animals to sin, they said, oh, that's God that, did, that, that put that restraint on me? I, I'd like to see that verse if you can find it. Uh, okay, uh, well, you know, I think about George Ryan, our governor. Uh, after he was sent to jail, he said, uh, oh... I should, have show, I should have put a greater restraint on some of my subordinates. Now, he realized that they got him in trouble. And he, he, was, he admitted, uh, I didn't control him very well. Rob Blagojevich, he said, as he was on his way to prison in Colorado, I'm going to prison not for anything I did, but for what I said. I don't, think, I don't know that Saddam Hussein ever felt bad about the way he, he misled. He got his country destroyed. Uh, but did he ever show any repentance of that? I don't know that he did. And what about Adolf Hitler? He got his country destroyed too. Did he ever show any repentance? No, I think he was too disillusional to do that. Um, the royal degree, decree continues in verse 8. Who knows? Now see, the king is unsure. He's still speaking. God may turn. We can't be certain of it. In that he may have compassion and turn from his burning anger so that we do not perish. In other words, Nineveh is not going to know whether they're going to survive or not until the end of 40 days. Now, I think maybe I mentioned this fellow to you, and I don't have time to repeat everything I told you about him, uh, but he was a missionary in, from China. I mean, he was an American in red China, and he got into, involved in an unhealthy relationship with a 25-year-old Chinese woman, and his wife asked him to break it off, and she, he said, I'm not going to do it. And so she brought him over to our house. She left and came back to America. He came after. He said, I want you in China with me. I'll go if you'll break up with that girl. No, I'm not going to do it. So I said, Brian, if you don't end that relationship, God himself may end it for you. He may strike you dead. And his exact words were, then that's exactly what must happen. 
And then a day or two later, he returned to China by himself. Two weeks after he returned, he just dropped dead. God, God gave him a chance. The, uh, the same thing with this fellow here. He left his wife in Chicago, went to Florida. He's always looking for a woman to support him. He had his wife work here in Chicago while he didn't do anything. Begged his wife to give him a new motorcycle. She did. And he told her, I'm leaving you. And he went down to Florida to live with his mother and grandmother so they could support him. And on Halloween night, he was on his motorcycle uh, going around a corner and a horse got out of a corral and he slammed into it. And I, I warned him, last time I talked to him, he was one of my students, I said, you, you are so, you talk a wonderful talk about what a great Christian you are. It's time to quit talking and start walking. He's so upset with me, he didn't say a word to me. Never did say another word to me. And uh, so on Halloween night, uh, he ran into that horse and was killed. This fellow, um, I was the interim pastor of a church in Wisconsin. When I knew him, he was a wonderful guy. He was real, he, God converted him and his wife from drug addiction. They were so in love with the Lord. He was in the worship band. And then uh, years later, um, he, his wife said, uh, Dan's got two idols, beer and his motorcycle. And so I only had one chance to talk to him. I warned him, you better stop all this. It'd be just like God to use that motorcycle to discipline you. And that went in one ear and out the other. And not long after that, he was on his motorcycle going to visit his brother. And a car turned left in front of him. And he ran into that car and got killed. And the driver said, I honestly didn't see him coming. I just didn't see him. So there are people who have another chance. And some make the most of it. And they go on and survive and have a good life. There are others who don't. And it's to their detriment. Verse 10 records God's response to Nineveh's repentance. When God saw their deeds, notice that word, action means more to God than words. How they turned away from their evil. There's real repentance. Remember what the Baptist said, show fruits consistent with repentance. If a person genuinely repents, there will be evidence of it, moral evidences of it in his life. Then he relented concerning the destruction which he had threatened to inflict on them. When Nineveh turned, God turned. When Nineveh turned from its evil, God turned from his plan to destroy them. Relented in that he did not carry it out. Matthew 12, 41. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation of the judgment. And remember who's talking here. Jesus is and condemns it because they repented at Jonah's preaching. And take note, someone greater than Jonah is here. Okay. Um, now... The point that I want to make here is this. Often it's those outside the church, outside the gospel, in the world, that are most responsive to it. Those sometimes in the church, in the Christian school, are so bored, they're burned out with the gospel. I don't know the gospel, I don't want to hear any more of it. I've had enough of it. And I mentioned in middle school, these three girls had to come stay at our house for a week. And uh, Jenny was an atheist. We had Bible study every night. And Jenny said one time, oh, wait a minute. If the gospel is true, my parents are going to hell. I don't want my parents to go to hell. Sarah was a Muslim. And she said, the God of the Quran is so stern, so angry, so harsh. There's no love in him. The God of the Bible is so loving and forgiving. And Heather, a purely pagan teenage girl, became wonderfully converted to Christ. She's still walking with the Lord today. And what was our daughter like in, in that week that we went over the Bible uh, at night? Oh, she was so bored with the gospel. I've heard this so many times. Can't we talk about something else? So let me repeat myself. Sometimes it's those outside Christian circles that are more open, more responsible than those inside of it. So any practical relevance to us? Are you dead in the head with Christianity, boy, it's a bad place to be. Are we burned out with the gospel? Or is there growing interest and enthusiasm? The more we learn about God's grace, the more we ought to appreciate it, the more enthusiastic we ought to be about it, the more we ought to be eager to give it out to sinners. Most of us need a second chance, let's ask the Lord for it. But if God gives us another chance, if we messed up somewhere, make the most of it. It may be the last chance we get. In times past, most of us have had opportunities have had have let opportunities slip through our fingers. 
Would you like a second chance to rectify those mistakes? God is likely willing to grant it to us, but it may involve moving us out of our comfort zone. Are you willing? Jonah was, but only reluctantly so, yet that was sufficient because God did a great work in him. In witnessing to others, have confidence in the truth. It's, it's God's power that works through his word. And wrath is coming. Does anybody here need to repent? Remember what the Baptist said? Who warned you from the wrath to come? Where'd you get that message from? Therefore, produce fruit. If you've heard the, the message that wrath is coming, what are you going to do about it? Repent and show evidence of it. Okay, so wait just a minute. I've asked Rick to come here. Come on up. You, you, you've got, Rick, you've got uh, five minutes here. I've asked Rick to come up here and share with you what he shared with me, and then we'll get back to your question. I got a question. Oh, you have a remark. I found that scripture, Genesis 9 and 5. 9 and 5? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. I'll take a look at that. Okay, Rick. Hello. Hello. I've been running around um, interacting with what God has brought to this city, which is a lot of strangers, a lot of empty people, a lot of refugees from all over the world. And it's amazing that um, they are here. Uh, I go out and I, I give Bibles to them. Gideon's giving me Bibles like I can. I got English, I got Hindi, I got uh, Arabic. It's, it's incredible. And, and the, the people are responding and they, they want family, they want connection, they want relationship. And it, it's just amazing. I, was, I only can carry four different languages because there's only me in my big pocket. But I pray that, praise God that he's showing me that, that uh, I am, I was a Christian who was nowhere. And I didn't understand and I didn't do anything. And he said, now you're a Christian that's now here. Same letters, nowhere to now here. And he, and he says, look, I brought the entire world to you. And I just walk 10 miles a day. It takes three hours. And I give away the Bibles. And I try to connect these people with, with church. Church is family. They don't want McDonald's for a year. They don't want a closet to live in. They want relationship. They've been stripped of everything that they ever had. They barely have any clothes. They, they are here and they don't understand why, but the, all, the most, who they want most is family. And I am now here, and they are now here. And God says, what's your move, Rick? I set the stage, I set the board. It's your move, Rick, what are you gonna do? I don't know how to speak their language. They are great at body language. I mean, you can connect with them and you communicate with them. And whether I, and, you know, and, and I, 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 I interact with probably 10 different people groups every day. And I don't have Cambodian and Romanian and Bulgarian and Russian and all these other things, but the people are here, the businesses are here. The, the God is saying, okay, let's do it now. Let's show this place, let's show this world what now here means. I'm not a nowhere God. I'm not, I don't want you to be a nowhere Christian. I want you to be a now here Christian. And, and if I don't want to be now here, then I don't, I worry about where I'm going to be when I die. But um, this is amazing that God has, has brought us to this point and given us, set our table, given us people mm -hmm. all around us. And I challenge you, go for a walk and just be friendly. These people are friendly. Jews are even friendly. I can, I can have a better conversation with a Jew than I can with an American. I'm good, I don't need that, you know, and, and, and that's what the American says, and the Jew says, sure, ask me your Jewish questions, because I have a lot of Jew questions that I don't understand, and they, they take the time and they explain things to me, and yeah, they, they, they have a funny way of dressing, and they wear different things, but, but they are friendly people, and they, and without the Jew, I wouldn't be a Christian, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and without uh, whatever, whatever God's doing, he's playing a big picture that is so big, and so incredible, and it's all about him. And he says, come on, Rick, let's be now here and see what I can do. Mm. And not see what you can do. They don't need a Rick. They need a Jesus. And so I'm, I'm out there, and I'm trying to connect with the people. And they are friendly. They are not going to bite your head off. And there might be a few bad apples, but that's very few. But they are here, and God says, come and show them friendship evangelism. Be their friend. Talk to them, walk with them, take them to uh, spend some time with them. They want time. They don't have, can you imagine coming here and, and no longer having your family? Your kids are gone, your relations are gone, all of your possessions are gone, 
And as you walked 2,000 miles to get to America, everybody along the way stripped you of everything, that, and you barely got into America, and all you have is one set of clothes, and that's it. And he says, Your time's up. Time's now. It's time to reach out and to be a friend. There's a friend over there, but I don't even speak his language. And, and I, I try to reach out to him, but I don't understand. And, and God says, I don't. I understand. Don't worry. I can do it. Mm -hmm. And he says, I, I know what I'm doing. And he does know what he's doing. And it's, a, it's an incredibly impressive um, privilege that we have to be on his team mm -hmm. and not to be running around doing our own thing. And the less I know, the less I'm gonna get in his way and be in his way. And that's what it's all about, being mm -hmm. in his way and reaching out. I can only carry four different languages, but maybe I'll get a just full of more pockets. But uh, there, there's, 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 the people are here, God just says, let's see what we can do now mm -hmm. and let's be here now and not be somewhere else that's a nowhere. There used to be a song about nowhere man, nowhere thing. Uh, so that's what I was for many years. God bless you. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. That, well, I, that was good. Now, Jonah had some time in the well to process what had happened. And that convinced him, okay, I need to go to Nineveh. I don't want to. It's going to take time and effort. And I don't like the Ninevites. I don't speak their language, their culture, but I need to go. And he did. And what was the result? Well, a whole nation repented. For, and that lasted for generations. That's why Assyria wasn't destroyed until about 150 years later when that godly influence began to wear off uh, later uh, generations. So um, <clears throat> Rick's reminding us that we don't have to go to Nineveh. God's brought Nineveh here. 